that he put his knees upon his neck and his back, grinding and crushing him until the very breath, no ladies and gentlemen, until the very life were squeezed out of him. Emotions running high today during opening statements as the murder trial of former Minneapolis police officer Derek Chauvin got underway today. Chauvin charged in the killing of George Floyd. The disturbing images that shocked and horrified the world all replayed for the jury and millions across the country today. A knee to the neck for nearly 10 minutes. The prosecutor going through the graphic details of George Floyd's final moments. Floyd saying he can't breathe 27 times, crying out for his mother as he ultimately took his last breath. Witnesses who were at the scene questioned on the stand today. The prosecution setting up their case telling the jury Chauvin used excessive force. The defense blaming Floyd's health and alleged drug use. Tonight, we'll dive into all of the angles and get the latest reaction to the, one of the biggest trials of the new millennium. Fourth wave fears, CDC Director Rochelle Walensky warning of, quote, impending doom. COVID hospitalizations on the rise, and roughly half of the country is seeing an increase in cases. Walensky says that right now she's scared. President Biden, meanwhile, urging governors to reinstate mask mandates, even as vaccine eligibility quickly expands. So what's behind the latest surge? In Brazil, the country is facing a nightmare. The variant spreads quickly. Hospitals are unable to keep up with the pace of the skyrocketing number of cases. Vaccine shortages and misinformation make it the deadliest place on the planet right now in terms of the virus. And a closer look at the concerns over pregnant people and vaccines. What you need to know. What's your message to pregnant women right now when it comes to the COVID-19 vaccine? They're one of the most popular toy makers in the country, Melissa and Dove, known for its back to basics approach, loved by parents and educators. There's a dark history to Melissa and Doug's story. Melissa opens up now about struggles with mental illness. And the canal is finally unclogged. The stuck container ship that was blocking global trade for days now on its way. The crew's wild celebration as it successfully refloated. What's the damage done as the investigation continues? Good evening, everyone. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. This was not about a split second decision. This was about a nine minute and 29 second decision. That was the argument of the prosecution today as the trial of Derek Chauvin got underway. The death of George Floyd after the confrontation at the corner of 38th and Chicago and Minneapolis caught the attention of the world as protesters turned one man's knee into a symbol of the oppression of black people around the globe. Reverend Al Sharpton describes it this way, saying, Chauvin is in the courtroom, but America is on trial, and Americans will be able to watch gavel to gavel in an unprecedented move by the judge in Minnesota, where broadcasts are typically not allowed. The entire trial is being live streamed, a global civics lesson of sorts on the American justice system. Many in the black community are hopeful for a different outcome than the cases of Breonna Taylor, Eric Gardner, Daniel Prude, and so many others who died at the hands of police and did not result in charges or convictions. So much hope and anxiety already already associated with this trial. Our Alex Perez is in Minneapolis and leads us off tonight. With the world watching, the prosecution in the most closely followed police misconduct trial in a generation today beginning their case, showing jurors the badge of the Minneapolis Police Department, highlighting the values it represents, compassion and the sanctity of life. Mr. Derek Chauvin betrayed this badge when he used excessive and unreasonable force upon the body of Mr. George Floyd. That he put his knees upon his neck and his back, grinding and crushing him until the very breath, no ladies and gentlemen, until the very life were squeezed out of him. You will learn what happened in that nine minutes and 29 seconds, the most important numbers you will hear in this trial are nine to nine. Prosecutor Jerry Blackwell emphasizing this case is only about the actions of one rogue officer. One of those things that this case is not about all police or all policing. Police officers have difficult jobs. They have to make split second decisions.
This case is not about split-second decision-making. Blackwell then preparing jurors for what they would soon see, the video that stunned America raw, unedited, and played for more than eight minutes. You will see that as Mr. Floyd is handcuffed there on the ground, he is verbalizing 27 times, you will hear, in the four minutes and 45 seconds, I can't breathe, please, I can't breathe. You hear him at some point cry out for his mother when he's being squeezed there. You will see that his respiration gets shallower and shallower and finally stops when he speaks his last words, I can't breathe. The prosecutor telling jurors to zero in on one key part. For roughly 53 seconds, he is completely silent and virtually motionless with just sporadic movements. It is the body's automatic reflex when breathing has stopped due to oxygen deprivation. Then the video. Please. We're going to ask at the end of this case that you find Mr. Chauvin guilty for his excessive use of force against George Floyd that was an assault that contributed to taking his life and for engaging in imminently dangerous behavior, putting a knee on the neck, the knee on the back for nine minutes and 29 seconds without regard for Mr. Floyd's life. Chauvin's attorney up next, moving ahead without acknowledging the horror of what the jury had just seen. Common sense tells you that there are always two sides to a story. There is no political or social cause in this courtroom. But the evidence is far greater than nine minutes and 29 seconds. Nelson arguing Floyd struggled and was difficult to subdue. You will see that three Minneapolis police officers could not overcome the strength of Mr. Floyd. Mr. Chauvin stands 5'9", 140 pounds. Mr. Floyd is 6'3", weighs 223 pounds. He told the jury the gathering crowd demanding Chauvin get off of Floyd created a, quote, high-stress situation. As the crowd grew in size, seemingly so too did their anger. There are cars stopping, people yelling. There are a, There is a growing crowd and what officers perceive to be a threat. Derek Chauvin did exactly what he had been trained to do over the course of his 19-year career. The use of force is not attractive, but it is a necessary component of policing. Chauvin's defense hoping to create reasonable doubt around what exactly killed George Floyd. The evidence will show that Mr. Floyd died of a cardiac arrhythmia that occurred as a result of hypertension, his coronary disease, the ingestion of methamphetamine and fentanyl, and the adrenaline throwing, flowing through his body all of which acted to further compromise an already compromised heart. The prosecutor then calling their first witness, 911 dispatcher Jenna Scurry. She watched the scene play out live over a city camera mounted nearby. She testified that at one point she thought her screen had frozen because the officers were on top of Floyd without moving for such a long time. My instincts were telling me that something's wrong. Something has not right. She says as she became so concerned, she phoned a supervising sergeant, a prosecutor's playing a recording of that call. You can call me a snitch if you want to. I don't know if they had used force or not. They got something out of the back of the squad, and all of them sat on this man. So I don't know if they needed you or not. The jury then hearing from an eyewitness, Donald Williams, who can be heard on that video begging officers to stop. Williams describing the last moments of George Floyd's life. Like the fish in the bag, you've seen his eyes slowly, you know, pale out and again, slowly roll to the back of his eyes. And he, um, so this is what I've seen, this is what I heard, and that's how, you know, what it was. Like he was going through distress because of a knee and he vocalized it that I can't breathe. I need to get up and I'm sorry. And his eyes slowly roll to the back of his head. You seen the blood coming out of his nose. You heard him tell him, tell him before he stopped speaking that my stomach hurts. And those most of the times is the last bowel movement of your life. So from there on, he was lifeless. He didn't move. He didn't speak. He didn't have no life in him, no more on his body movements. 
Boy, 10 months later, still difficult to see and hear that. We are joined now by Alex Perez from Minneapolis. Alex, as you report, George Floyd's cause of death is certainly a key issue here. But under the law, Chauvin can still be convicted, even if his actions weren't the only cause of Floyd's death. Yeah, Lindsay, so they're going to get into very specifics here, and that word, cause, will play a key role in this trial. The prosecutor has to prove that Derek Chauvin's actions caused George Floyd to die, caused, led, triggered him to die. Now, the defense, of course, argues that it was his untreated heart condition and the drugs in his system that led to his death, but the prosecutor says if uh, Chauvin's knee was not on top of George Floyd, he could very possibly still be alive. So that word cause, it's going to be very, very important as the trial moves forward, Lindsay. And the expectation of this trial is going to last three to four weeks. Yeah, Lindsay, so we're expecting it to last about a month, according to the judge. You can see the courthouse behind me here. The rest of the building is shut down. It's surrounded by National Guardsmen. As a matter of fact, the jurors are escorted in and out by security every day away from the public's view. Lindsay? Alex Perez, our thanks to you. The testimonies inside the courtroom have led to a reaction outside of the courthouse as once again all eyes are on the city of Minneapolis. ABC's Kenneth Moten is in Minneapolis for us where he's been talking with community members about the reopening of this wound. Kenneth, it's the end of day one of the trial. Set the scene for us. Have you seen any demonstrations and, and what are you hearing from people in Minneapolis? Exhausted, Lindsay. Exhausted is the first word that comes to mind because these supporters of George Floyd and his family have been in these streets uh, demonstrating day in, day out uh, during jury selection and also now during this trial. In fact, right now there's a demonstration. Many of them have been happening behind me on the other side of this courthouse. Uh, but demonstrations literally every single day have been chanting those familiar Black Lives Matter chants that, again, we've heard all so often uh, when it comes to these police-involved uh, killings, these shootings. Um, and remember, the world has seen this video of George Floyd dying at the knee of police, but it's the city of Minneapolis that's been dealing with this uh, daily. And for many, this felt like ground zero. It felt like the epicenter of the racial reckoning uh, that we've been dealing with. And so, it's stressful. Um, again, it's exhausting. Uh, but these people say they want to be here to support the family of George Floyd and demand justice as well. And Lindsay, we know that last night members of Floyd's family and civil rights leaders gathered in a church for a prayer service. Uh, you mentioned at the top of the show just now that someone said Reverend Al Sharpton was the person who said Chauvin is on trial, yes, but also the criminal justice system is on trial. America is on trial. Lindsay? And I was also reading that between Hennepin County and the city of Minneapolis, they're going to spend a million dollars on security. Tell us a little bit about the police presence there. Is it just local law enforcement, and are you hearing plans for bigger demonstrations in the coming days? We know that police have increased security. You heard Alex Perez just mentioned National Car Guard. They've been mobilized. They're also in the scene protecting this government center, this courthouse uh, behind me. But they've been allowing protesters, demonstrators, to do their thing on the streets, uh, to exercise their First Amendment rights there here in Minneapolis. We know that will continue. We do expect there will be larger protests. And the reason for that, Lindsay, is because of the testimonies we're hearing. As we hear from more witnesses, it really is opening up that fresh wound uh, here in this community. And so as we hear from more of these witnesses, some of whom we've never heard from before because they're state witnesses, and so now they're having their day in court, as we hear from them, we expect there to be larger demonstrations. In fact, there's going to be one planned for this Saturday. They're on Chicago Avenue at that intersection where George Floyd died. Lindsay. Kenneth Moten for us on the ground in Minneapolis. Thanks so much. We're joined now by attorney Lance LaRusso, who has represented more than 80 officers involved in on-duty shootings or in-custody deaths, and who serves as an attorney for a former Atlanta police officer who shot Rayshard Brooks last summer. As you've been watching this opening day of the trial, just give us your take on the Chauvin defense team strategy and the effectiveness of focusing on what may have been the root cause of George Floyd's death. 
Well, as I've said to start with, and I appreciate you having me, the, the bottom line is we can already see the beginnings from both sides of a defense that's anticipated and the burden of the prosecution. They're going to have to show that whatever actions were taken by Derek Chauvin actually led to his death. And they have to prove that, the prosecution has to prove that beyond a reasonable doubt. And as someone who's been in courtrooms defending police officers, just explain the goal with the jury and how the defense is looking to reach that standard of reasonable doubt. I think one of the things that we saw from the uh, defense counsel was an outset statement in the opening to focus on what's happening in the courtroom. And I think one of the jurors said it best. I know there's, there's facts I'm going to hear in this courtroom that no one else knows. And I think the defense attorney did a great job of saying you have to focus on what's happening here and the time outside of this, this business when this arrest took place and take your focus off of the biggest, bigger picture and what was happening this summer with the riots and, and uh, protests. And we also heard that new testimony from the 911 dispatcher who alerted a police sergeant to what she saw unfolding on camera, including that little detail about her thinking that the camera may have actually frozen because Chauvin was in the same position on Floyd's back for so long. How impactful could that kind of testimony be? And how do you think the defense handled it in cross? I think there were two uh, different points in the, about that that I think are powerful. Number one is the fact that this is a person who has witnessed uh, police use of force before. Perfect lawful force will never look good on video. So obviously she, they brought out that something she saw attracted her attention to a point where she actually called and said something was wrong. The second thing I think we need to take from that is that it was possible for someone to have their knee or their foot or their back or their arm in an area what we would call a no touch area or a no force area, but she expected it to be removed. And I think that's what she was saying, that she may not be a police officer, but she was surprised by the duration of the, uh, the pressure on his neck. And I think that's what this is going to focus on. And we saw that in the prosecution statement when they said that, you know, there were all these attendant medical conditions, but they were interrupted. He lived with them very well until May 25th when the knee was put on his neck for nine minutes. So I think all of that is, is tying very well into it. Is there something that you think that the prosecution did exceptionally well today that might be difficult for the defense to combat? They started out at the outset focusing the jury on the video. And I think that's probably the best and most powerful evidence that the uh, prosecution has, not just because of this case, but people are accustomed to seeing video. We now have gotten so accustomed to seeing either police video or video from um, live TV, all sorts of uh, videos that we see on the news. So drawing the jury's attention and saying, just look at what you see in front of your eyes and trying to say, don't focus on anything else, because there is going to be a tremendous amount of medical evidence that we expect. They mentioned something about 400 witnesses, 50,000 documents. This is going to be a very, very intense um, set of facts for the jury to focus on. So I think their prosecution is trying to keep the jury focused on the big picture. Still super early, just day one in the trial that's expected to go potentially three to four weeks. Did you feel that there was a side that was more effective just today? No, I think that, you, as you said, you hit the nail on the head. This is at the beginning stages. I think both sides are kind of jockeying for position. And what's happening in the courtroom is both, of the, both the prosecution and defense are watching the jury. Who is paying attention more to certain evidence? Who is focused more intently uh, than another juror? So the prosecutor and the defense lawyer are still feeling out the jury to see what's important to them. I was surprised that some evidence was allowed in. There was one witness that said that police are always down in this area messing with people. I was kind of surprised the judge let that in because the bottom line is this is about this, this police officer on this particular day. And statements like that could be prejudicial to a point where it could uh, interfere with the jury's decision on these facts. Attorney Lance LaRusso, appreciate your insight. Thanks so much for talking with us today. Thanks for having me. We'd now like to bring in Bridget Floyd, George Floyd's sister. Bridget, so appreciate you speaking with us on what we can only imagine is a, a super emotional day for you. How are you tonight? And, and if you will, tell us why you chose not to watch today's opening statements in this murder trial. Um, I decided to uh, miss out on the opening statement because I am not ready to see the video of my brother being murdered. Do you plan on entering the courtroom once you're allowed? I've been thinking about it. I haven't made a final decision yet, though. 
Special Prosecutor Jerry Blackwell played for the court in live stream for the world portions of that harrowing video of your brother today calling out for help while Officer Chauvin pressed his knee into his neck. How do you feel about those long minutes being replayed almost in their entirety? And is this a video that you feel people should see? Even if they're not on the jury, we should say. Um. I think it's definitely a video that the world needs to see, the world has seen. And um, it's very important that they watch it very carefully because there were some things that just wasn't done correctly um, that you do as a police officer. Uh, some things, you know, how, the, the training, uh, all that disturbs me because um, they allowed that to happen for eight minutes and 46 seconds to my dear brother uh, without feeling any kind of remorse. That's, that's the part that hurts the most. What does this trial mean for you and for your family? Justice. A lot, a lot of justice. That's what we're praying the outcome is. I think that's what it's going to be. Because when you commit a crime, you need to take responsibility and do the time and be held accountable for your actions. One word that we did not hear in either side's opening statement, which has been so central to the discussion about your brother's passing, is race. What role do you think that race played in these events? And, and were you surprised that it was not presented in these opening statements? Um, it's not surprising that um, the word race wasn't brought up or hasn't been brought up because they don't want to admit the truth. And the truth is that um, we have a lot of racism going on in the world today. You don't see things like that happen to uh, white people. Um, a lot of African-American people are done the way my brother was done. But this one, this one was a little bit different. It was very different. Um, out of all the black Americans that has, has been um, dealt with police, police brutality, he lost his life to murder, straight murder. As Chauvin's attorney today suggested that your brother died because of drugs that he took and a pre-existing heart condition, how do you respond to that argument? They will find any way possible for this police officer to not look bad. But the whole world saw what happened to him. Um, he know what he was doing. And the look on his face, they tell me, was that he didn't care. He kept putting more force and force and force on him until he stopped breathing. So the drugs that they say they found in his system did not kill him. I don't even believe that's true because our investigators told us what killed my brother. And that was the pressure that was kneeled down in his neck. So I'm not surprised that they come up with all these uh, false stories it's not surprising to me, but one thing for sure, two things for certain, the world seen how my brother left this world. Sure did. In his opening statement, Special Prosecutor Jerry Blackwell talked a bit about who George Floyd was, where he was from, his love of basketball and football, his work. Uh, we've heard him described as a gentle giant. Tell us who your brother was to you and others who loved him. All of that is true. All of that is true. My brother was a generous man, a gentle giant, a father, an uncle. He was filled with a lot of, lot of love that you don't see most people have these days. So when you met Floyd, is what I called him, it was like polite that brightens a dark room 
He was so filled with joy that you couldn't even tell if anything was bothering him. He loved his family. And I will forever keep his name alive. Miss Bridget Floyd, we thank you so much for talking with us and for your time tonight. I appreciate you guys as well. Keep praying for us because we need it. And now to the other major news tonight, fears of a fourth COVID wave. The head of the CDC points to new cases, hospitalizations, and now another increase in deaths. This as more Americans become eligible for a vaccine. Here's ABC's Eva Pilgrim. With the country averaging more than 60,000 cases of the coronavirus every day, the CDC director bluntly warning of another surge. I'm going to lose the script and I'm going to reflect on the recurring feeling I have of impending doom. We have so much to look forward to, so much promise and potential of where we are, and so much reason for hope. But right now, I'm scared. Hospital admissions up more than 10% across 17 states in the last week, and the numbers of death rising too. In Michigan, hospitals seeing a surge of patients in their 30s and 40s. These are the younger group ages at the present time who have not been vaccinated. New York City and New Jersey leading the country again with the highest rates of infection. But after pausing the state's reopening, New Jersey's governor today easing rules on indoor entertainment and outdoor gatherings. As the weather gets warmer, we are urging everyone to engage in social activities outside whenever possible. Today, President Biden saying some states should pause their reopenings and called on states that have lifted mask mandates to reinstate them. As we're in the life and death race for the virus that is spreading quickly. President announcing today that the majority of American adults will be eligible for the vaccine ahead of his May 1st deadline. At least 90 percent of all adults in this country will be eligible to be vaccinated by April the 19th, just three weeks from now because we have the vaccines. To speed up vaccinations, the administration will open more mass vaccination sites and add 20,000 more pharmacies. The goal, to give most Americans access to a vaccine within five miles of their home. Today, six more states making the vaccine available to anyone over 16. And starting tomorrow, New York giving the green light to anyone 30 and up. The country has lost nearly 550,000 lives to the virus. Overnight, President Trump's coronavirus task force coordinator, Dr. Deborah Burks, telling CNN she believes most of the deaths could have been avoided had the administration responded more effectively. There were about 100,000 deaths that came from that original surge. All of the rest of them, in my mind, could have been mitigated or decreased substantially. A CDC study found that the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines were 90% effective at preventing both symptomatic and asymptomatic disease. They appeared to be 80% effective two weeks after one dose. The research also suggests that the vaccine slows the spread of the virus. Doctors are reminding patients you need both doses to be considered fully vaccinated and have max protection. Lindsay. Eva, thanks so much. When we come back, the horrific and deadly carjacking authorities say started when two teens tried to steal an Uber Eats driver's car. What we're learning about a new joint report from the World Health Organization and China, it addresses allegations that the virus leaked from a Chinese lab. But up next, it's the new global epicenter of the pandemic, thousands dying of dead daily. The toll fueled by a variant that's more contagious can reinfect those who've already been beaten COVID. And has also been detected here in the United States. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. We have made it through another week together. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. Admit it, these days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America in the afternoon? GMA 3, what you need to know. Lunchtime at 1 Eastern, 12 Central and Pacific on ABC. It's all about you. 
Robin Roberts, George Stephanopoulos, Michael Strahan. Wake up with America's number one most watched morning show, ABC's Good Morning America. The world may feel out of your control, but your happiness doesn't have to be. Learn the secrets to happiness. Listen to the 10% Happier podcast, free on Apple Podcasts. ABC News, honored. Winner for the second straight year with the Edward R. Murrow Award for Overall Excellence in Television. ABC News, America's number one news source. Friday nights, 9, 8 central. True crime, cinematic, real-life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues, the hunt, true crime. 2020, Friday nights, 9, 8 central on ABC. Reality is our country can collapse from within. You see the white power movement on the march. You will not replace us! Klansmen and neo-Nazis, skinheads, it's meant to incite war. From the KKK to Oklahoma City to Charlottesville, the new documentary event special. We just need to start talking about race. Homegrown hate, the war among us. This is a real wake-up call. Streaming now on ABC News Live. Now, when it matters most, the straightforward facts. ABC News is America's number one news. Number one in the morning. Number one in the evening with America's most watched newscast. Number one in late night versus the competition. The number one news magazine on Friday nights. Number one in politics across this historic election versus the competition. The number one daytime talk show. And number one in streaming news. ABC News is America's number one news. Welcome back. Brazil has two-thirds the population of the United States, but their daily deaths are rapidly catching up to the levels we witnessed here in the United States during the height of the pandemic. There is no place harder hit in the globe right now than Brazil from COVID, and experts say it's only getting worse. Victor Akendo has more. 63-year-old Jose Roberto Inacio spent most of his career as an ambulance driver, transporting the sick from his small community to the nearest major town. He got sick from COVID a few weeks ago and along with 69 others, waited for one of the 50 full ICU beds near him to open up. He died waiting. This is the reality of a healthcare system on the brink of collapse. Brazil, Latin America's biggest country, is now the epicenter of the global coronavirus crisis, <laughs> surpassing more than 300,000 deaths, with an average daily death toll higher than any other nation. For Sao Paulo ICU nurse Flavia Machado, it's more than she can handle. We have been doing this for a year now, and it causes additional stress, which is the stress of knowing that we are not helping everyone who needs us. The stress of knowing that when a patient leaves, I already have four, five, six, so many. Most of the recent cases have been caused by the variant P1 born out of the Amazonian city Manaus. The P1 strain is more contagious and is able to reinfect up to 61% of those who should be immune, and it's already spread to at least 20 other countries, including the United States. ICUs in 25 of Brazil's 26 states are now at 80% capacity, seeing patients sicker and younger than the previous wave. What we're seeing now are patients arriving quickly, and we are unable to cope because we always knew patients spend a long time here. They stay in ICU, and there are no vacancies for more patients to arrive. Right-wing President Jair Bolsonaro, infamous for raising doubts over vaccines and pushing unproven treatments, continues to undermine lockdown efforts. Just last week, coming under fire for celebrating his birthday with supporters. If someone thinks that one day we will give up our freedoms, then they are mistaken. But among local officials, there is growing acceptance that lockdowns are unavoidable. Rio and Sao Paulo imposing extensive restrictions, creating a 10-day holiday to encourage Brazilians to stay home. But some Brazilians are resistant, thousands taking to the streets to protest the new measures. Today, I am protesting against Joao Agrippino Doria's dictatorial attitude. He wants to impose a lockdown on the population, put an end to employment, put an end to health, to put an end to the people of Sao Paulo. The vaccine rollout has been slow in Brazil, with under 4% of the population vaccinated, having only just begun the process mid-January. 
Now Bolsonaro is changing his tune with an election coming up next year and his political rival, former President Luis Inacio Lula da Silva, rejoining the national stage. There's pressure to purchase more vaccines. Brazil unveiling plans for a July rollout of its own vaccine just last week. But as the daily death toll inches higher and approaches 4,000 a day, there are concerns that the worst days lay ahead. Given the huge volume of patients, we start to suffer from the scarcity of basic materials. We are going to have serious problems in the coming days with sedatives and neuromuscular blockers. And this does not only apply to our hospital, that's for all of them. As health officials have warned since the pandemic began, if the coronavirus isn't contained in all places, it will have the chance to spread or mutate, posing a continued threat to the world. Victor Okendo, ABC News. Our thanks to Victor for that. Still ahead here on Prime, that cargo ship that ground one of the world's busiest waterways to a halt has now been freed. But how long will it take for the billions worth of cargo that was at a standstill to start moving again? There's been so much misinformation, in some cases disinformation, about COVID vaccines and pregnancy. So tonight, we take a look at fact versus fiction. And the jurors, the timeline, the nuts and bolts of the Chauvin trial, we take a look by the numbers. But first, our tweet of the day. Former President Barack Obama paying tribute to his grandmother who passed away. Sarah Obama, the matriarch of the Kenyan branch of the former first family, was 99 years old. We will guide you through it all tonight. We have made it through another week together. Give me a big hug, Rich. tell all our patients how much they're loved to hold their hands. David, we're showing our love and support for all the ICU staff. They're the heroes in this. <laughs> Now, when it matters most, the straightforward facts. ABC News is America's number one news. Number one in the morning. Number one in the evening. With America's most watched newscast. Number one in late night versus the competition. The number one news magazine on Friday nights. Number one in politics across this historic election versus the competition. The number one daytime talk show. And number one in streaming news. ABC News is America's number one news. The world may feel out of your control, but your happiness doesn't have to be. Learn the secrets to happiness. Listen to the 10% Happier podcast, free on Apple Podcasts. ABC News, honored. Winner for the second straight year with the Edward R. Murrow Award for overall excellence in television. ABC News, America's number one news source. This is GMA3, what you need to know. GMA3. A third hour of Good Morning America in the afternoon. It's all about you. Lunchtime on ABC. The reality is our country can collapse from within. You see the white power movement on the march. Klansmen and neo-Nazis, skinheads, it's meant to incite war. From the KKK to Oklahoma City to Charlottesville, the new documentary event special. We just need to start talking about race. Homegrown hate, the war among us. This is a real wake-up call. Streaming now on ABC News Live. Friday nights, 9, 8 central. True crime, cinematic, real-life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues, the hunt, true crime, 2020. Friday nights, 9, 8 central on ABC. The most powerful stories of our time, anytime. Nightline. Welcome back, everyone, and now to the landmark murder trial of former officer Derek Chauvin in the death of George Floyd. Here's a look at the case by the numbers. Chauvin faces three felony charges, second-degree unintentional murder, third-degree murder, and second-degree manslaughter, and up to 40 years in prison for the most serious offense. Three other former Minneapolis police officers have also been charged in connection with Floyd's death and are scheduled to be tried in August. Nine minutes and 29 seconds, that's how long Chauvin's 
knee pressed into Floyd's neck and 27 times Floyd said he couldn't breathe. That's according to prosecutors. Deciding Chauvin's fate will be a diverse jury of eight white people and six people of color. Nine are women and five are men. The murder trial is expected to last about four weeks. The arrest that led to these cascading events began with a counterfeit $20 bill that Floyd used to buy cigarettes. Still have lots ahead here on Prime tonight. The violence in Myanmar continuing to escalate. What will the international community do? And with people in Tennessee and across the South still cleaning up from the latest round of storms, word of a new storm threat. But first, to look at our top trending stories on abcnews.com. I know what happened, and I'm not guilty. Why the fascination with criminal trials? Figure out what's really out there. She revealed she had murdered his family. I know in my heart that he did this. It's the time of suspicion. The ending's really tough. You don't know whether truth is going to be difficult to find unless you try to find it. Assault on the Capitol, the ABC News original, exclusively on Hulu, now streaming. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. We have made it through another week together. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. The world may feel out of your control, but your happiness doesn't have to be. Learn the secrets to happiness. Listen to the 10% Happier podcast, free on Apple Podcasts. Robin Roberts, George Stephanopoulos, Michael Strahan. Wake up with America. America's number one most watched morning show, ABC's Good Morning America. Wednesday night, we are going to Hollywood. So if you want to hit it big and make it in showbiz, you're going to need some help from powerful people. One person with power can turn your world around. She goes, I have a role. We think you would be perfect for it. It was a dream job. This is where things start to go off script. There is no film. It's a scam. Oh, my God. You know, they say people in Hollywood can sometimes be a little sketchy. <laughs> Honey, you have no idea. I'm Whoopi Goldberg. This is The Con. Wednesday night on ABC. ABC News. Honored. Winner for the second straight year with the Edward R. Murrow Award for Overall Excellence in Television. ABC News, America's number one news source. The prosecution in the most closely followed police misconduct trial in a generation today beginning their case. Mr. Derek Chauvin betrayed this badge when he used excessive and unreasonable force upon the body of Mr. George Floyd. Blackwell then preparing jurors for what they would soon see, the video that stunned America raw, unedited, and played for more than eight minutes. For roughly 53 seconds, he is completely silent and virtually motionless with just sporadic movements. Chauvin's attorney up next, moving ahead without acknowledging the horror of what the jury had just seen. Common sense tells you that there are always two sides to a story. Chauvin's defense hoping to create reasonable doubt around what exactly killed George Floyd. The evidence will show that Mr. Floyd died of a cardiac arrhythmia that occurred as a result of hypertension, his coronary disease, the ingestion of methamphetamine and fentanyl, and the adrenaline throwing, flowing through his body, all of which acted to further compromise an already compromised heart. To report on the origins of COVID-19 in Wuhan, China, is due out tomorrow. The uh, WHO has received the full mission report over uh, the weekend. Reportedly concluding that the virus most likely spread directly from bats to another animal and then to humans. The 100-plus page report from the World Health Organization and China also finding that it was, quote, extremely unlikely the virus escaped from a Wuhan lab. For now, um, all hypotheses uh, will be on the table and will need 
uh, for their study. China's delay in allowing outside experts in has cast a shadow over the investigation. Two teenage girls arrested after police say they violently attacked and killed an Uber Eats driver in Washington, D.C. Police say the suspects were in the process of trying to steal 66-year-old Mohammed Anwar's car when one of them used a taser on him as they tried to speed off, which police say led to the deadly car crash. The teens arrested at the scene. It's more than tragic. I don't even know if th that word um, describes what happened. Police say they've seen a spike in carjackings in Washington, D.C. and in several other major cities since the pandemic began. It's very important uh, that we find out the people who are responsible for, for these carjackings uh, and that, th that we have justice. More blood on the streets of Myanmar. On Saturday, the military killed over a hundred people as it turned its guns on protesters opposed to its coup last month, the bloodiest day since protests began. This mother mourning at the funeral of her 13-year-old son. Thousands still protested again today, the military again opening fire. Some protesters now trying to fight back, armed with slingshots against live ammunition. There are fears Myanmar is sinking into chaos. Thousands are now fleeing towards Thailand after the military launched airstrikes on areas populated by the Karen people, an ethnic group already locked in decades-old conflict. The US and much of the international community have condemned the military's actions. A Catholic funeral mass being held today in Denver, Colorado for 51-year-old Boulder police officer Eric Talley, just one of the 10 people killed in last Monday's mass shooting at a supermarket. Welcome back. The ships are able to move again through the Suez Canal after the desperate efforts to free a cargo ship that got stuck proved successful. So how did they finally do it and how long will it take for all that cargo that was unable to move to reach its intended destination? James Longman has more. Celebrations on the Suez. Tonight, one of the world's largest ships finally freed after nearly a week blocking one of the world's most important trade routes. A monster bottleneck that could be seen from space. And the container ships alone cost as much as $10 billion in global trade each day they sat idle on the water. Helped by the tides, Egyptian tugboats pulled and pushed from either side, working with specialist engineers from around the world who dredged some 30,000 cubic metres of sand from under the hull. That's enough to fill a dozen Olympic-sized swimming pools. Now the slow process of easing the huge traffic jam of hundreds of ships has begun, something Suez Canal authorities say will take about three days. But the incident is still far-reaching, experts warning the disruption to global shipping could take weeks or more to unravel. So still potentially weeks of fallout from this. ABC's James Longbin joins us now. James, you mentioned the massive traffic jam caused for the past week by this blockage. So how quickly will ships be able to move through the Suez Canal now? And what kind of economic impact could this all have? <laughs> And India, it's really hard to know about the immediate economic impact, but I think the first way is supply chains. You know, things don't just go from A to B anymore. They go A to B to C to D all around the world in our interconnected world. And I think it's going to be many months before we really know the full economic impact. One material way we know, though, is some of these ships having to turn around and go around Africa. You mentioned about 300 ships there waiting. Some of them didn't want to wait and they went around. That's cost a lot of money. It takes about 26 days to go around Africa, depending on the ship, and that's at about $30,000 of fuel a day. So that is a lot of money. Uh, a lot of port authorities uh, have penalties for ships that turn up late. That can be from about $15,000 a day. All of this adds up. Premiums, again, insurance premiums have skyrocketed as a result of this for shipping and cargo companies. All of these costs will be at some stage passed on to the consumer. We won't know about that just yet, but it is going to happen at some stage, Lindsay. And what's next for the ship known as the Ever Given that caused this to, to block the Suez Canal? Well, there's going to be an investigation. They're going to have a look at it uh, in a lot of detail. It's being moved to Bitter Lake, which is uh, kind of a larger water 
way uh, just north of where it was stuck along the Suez Canal. They're going to have a full assessment of its hull to make sure it can still get back out there in the water. On the day, uh, the wind was said to be going at about 40 knots. Was that enough to push it off course or was human error involved? There's going to be an investigation. But I think over and above all this, it's really put into sharp relief uh, our global requirement for stuff, for commercial goods. And it's, it's kind of made us think about where things come from and how vulnerable our supply chains are. You know, we aren't really meant to think about where this stuff comes from, but now we've seen, and it can get stuck on the Suez Canal like that. Just to put it into perspective, about this is one of the biggest boats in the world. About 10 years ago, the biggest ship in the world was half this size. That's how enormous our growth, the growth has been in our sheer desire for stuff. And I think that's what people are really thinking about looking at this whole issue. Lindsay? Right. We are so dependent on it. James Longman, our thanks to you. The cleanup continues in the Nashville area after the worst flooding in a decade hit that city, causing dozens of high water rescues. This was all from a storm system that spawned heavy rain, tornadoes, and damaging winds from the south to the northeast. And now our weather team is monitoring a new threat. Chief Meteorologist Ginger Z is tracking it all for us. Hey, Ginger. Hey there, Lindsay. It's been a gusty day in the northeast in New England after that storm passed through, but now we have to look at the new storm. And yes, there are wind alerts from Wausau, Wisconsin, back through parts of Montana. I have to tell you that there are red flag warnings, meaning that the fire danger is high as far south as El Paso. So any fire that does get started is going to become erratic with these types of winds. And now what type of wind are we talking? The gusts could easily get to 60 miles per hour. That's the type that can take down trees, power lines, and it doesn't come along with a thunderstorm. This is just truly wind. The hold on to your hat or it's going to fly. Wichita could see gusts up to 52 miles per hour, Des Moines 44, and that's through Tuesday morning too. So it doesn't stop there. Minneapolis is going to get out on it. Chicago certainly going to live up to their name. Even Green Bay uh, could see 36 mile per hour gusts. Now watch this future cast because this is the storm as it moves east and out of the plains in the Rockies right over the southeast. We could see more thunderstorms for those very hard hit areas, including Alabama. That's Tuesday. And then into Wednesday, Georgia gets in, North Carolina, South Carolina, right back into the mid-Atlantic. This time of year, you have these dynamic shifts in the jet stream, big dips of cold, big ridges where we get those warm days, like 80s, like we had last week. And that change, that temperature gradient, Lindsay, is how we get severe weather. So unfortunately, that looks like it's sticking around. But we are grateful when we can get those warm days, Ginger. More of those. Thanks so yeah. much. <laughs> okay. Now to the COVID-19 vaccine and pregnancy. A new study has determined the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines are safe for pregnant women and even provide antibodies to newborns. But rampant misinformation and disinformation has spread online and may still be fueling distrust of the vaccine among some expectant moms. ABC's Ariel Reshef has this story. San Antonio emergency room physician Dr. Nayeli Rodolfo Zayas spent last summer working in the ICU, treating the most severe COVID-19 patients too often, watching them die from the insidious disease. This year has changed my life completely. At the height of quarantine, she found out she was expecting her second child. And like for so many pregnant women, the pandemic brought on an avalanche of added anxiety. It just became a very difficult uh, time for me. And at the same time, of course, I was pregnant and I wanted to be careful and protect myself and not catch the disease. For Dr. Rodolfo, the weight of uncertainty compounding the already heightened emotions of pregnancy. And as she continued working on the front lines, she also feared for her own mother, a 57-year-old on dialysis. So when she got the call in June of 2020 that her mom had tested positive for the virus, her heart sank. She called me and told me she was positive. I became really concerned. My mom had uh, end-stage renal disease and she had liver disease and diabetes. So I knew that this could be pretty bad and it was. Did your mom know that you were pregnant? Yes, my mom knew she, I was pregnant when she was sick, yes. I was trying to give her hope or give her something to like hold on to so she could fight through. And I think it became clear that she was just getting sicker and sicker. She watched as her mother's condition quickly deteriorated, and as she had done with her own patients, she stood at her mother's bedside as she passed away. So she was uh, admitted um, and then passed away four days later in the ICU. I was the physician who pronounced her. 
For Dr. Rodolfo, after nearly a year of loss and grief, she found a ray of hope in the form of the FDA authorized COVID-19 vaccine. At 31 weeks pregnant, she got her first dose of the Pfizer vaccine in December. I basically, you know, was excited and, and happy and felt a sense of relief to get this vaccine. Of course, it was a bittersweet sweet moment for me as well because I was thinking about my mother. If she would have made it through, she would have gotten the vaccine and she would still be here. But amid the vaccine rollout, misinformation, and in some cases, disinformation about the vaccine and pregnancy have spread online, fueling skepticism among some pregnant women. There's nothing about these vaccines that make us concerned that they're going to cause problems either for the mother or the infant. Um, or the fetus. Um, and in addition to that, I think that we also um, can say that now well over 40,000 pregnant women have been vaccinated and we have not seen any safety signals in, um, in, in these women. Dr. Laura Riley is the chief OBGYN at New York Presbyterian and Weill Cornell Medicine. She says the conversation with her pregnant patients about the vaccine is a delicate but essential one because pregnant women were excluded from early vaccine studies. What do you say to those pregnant women who say, I'm just going to wait and see. I want more data before I get vaccinated. I totally understand. Um, I get it. Uh, the problem with waiting and seeing is that you increase the risk that you're going to get COVID while you're waiting. Pregnant women are at greater risk for severe outcomes due to COVID-19. And that means more likely to, you know, need an ICU stay, more likely to need mechanical ventilation, and also an increased risk of death. But now studies in pregnant women are underway and months of experience with the vaccines gives leading experts confidence that they are safe for pregnant women and those planning to become pregnant. The American Society for Reproductive Medicine issuing a statement reading in part, we stand by our recommendation that pregnant women and those seeking to become pregnant should be vaccinated. In February, Pfizer began clinical trials of its vaccine of 4,000 pregnant women. Pfizer's trial will be conducted in 44 study locations across the U.S. Participants will receive doses between their fifth and eighth month of pregnancy and will be studied for seven to ten months even after they give birth. <laughs> Idaho mother of four, Ginger Bennett, volunteered to participate in the Pfizer trial. She spoke exclusively with ABC News before her second shot. Hey, that's it. Okay. So why put yourself out there and join a trial um, of a new medication? To my knowledge, I am the first pregnant woman in the state of Idaho doing this test. And I figure if I can show or tell something to these other women that are wondering, hey, what's going on for me? Um, then I want to show that to them. Ginger is due in April with a baby girl and won't know if she received a placebo or the actual vaccine until then, but says she hopes that sharing her experience in the trial will help assuage some fears for other pregnant women. I'm glad I get to be a part of this because I'm like, hey, I know there are other women out there in my place and they're just, maybe they're worried or maybe they just have questions. And seeing this, hopefully they'll say, hey, she's, she's doing okay or she's not worried about it. Maybe I shouldn't be worried about it either. And while recent polls show vaccine hesitancy has declined overall as more doses are administered, Dr. Rodolfo says it was important to her to share her story for other Latinx women to see. There's a lot of hesitancy and misinformation also um, floating around. So I was just trying to set an example for women and for Hispanic women in particular who are at higher risk. In January, Dr. Rodolfo gave birth to a healthy baby boy named Ben and she's since found out he has COVID-19 antibodies as a result of her vaccine. Nayeli, what does it mean to you now to know that your newborn is protected with antibodies because of your decision to get vaccinated? I am just, just grateful that he was able to get these antibodies and that once I go back to work and he has to go to daycare, he has that extra protection. 
Um, so I'm very, very happy and very grateful that I made this decision. For the mom of two, getting the shot was about more than protecting herself and her family. Did you feel like you were honoring your mother by getting vaccinated? My mother was a very caring individual and she always took care of herself and wanted to protect others. So I know she would have been on board with getting the vaccine. And in this way, I felt like I was honoring her. What's your message to pregnant women right now when it comes to the COVID-19 vaccine? I think given how serious COVID-19 could be in pregnancy and the fact that um, we're getting more and more safety data, um, I say get vaccinated, protect yourself and, you know, protect your baby. Ariel Reshef, ABC News, New York. Our thanks to Ariel for that. Finally, the image of the day. The headstone reads George Floyd. It's part of the Say Their Name Cemetery in Minneapolis. Floyd's grave marker is one of 100 at the site who were killed by law enforcement. That is our show for this hour. Be sure to stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Coming up after the break here on Prime, we'll hear from George Floyd's daughter with the Chauvin trial now underway. And her toys have brought so many joy. But tonight, Melissa, co-founder of Melissa and Doug Toys, is opening up about a lifelong struggle that she had and the mission she has begun as a result. Now, when it matters most, the straightforward facts. ABC News is America's number one news. Number one in the morning. Number one in the evening. With America's most watched newscast. Number one in late night versus the competition. The number one news magazine on Friday nights. Number one in politics across this historic election versus the competition. The number one daytime talk show. And number one in streaming news. ABC News is America's number one news. The most powerful stories of our time, anytime. Nightline. Friday nights, 9 8 Central. True crime, cinematic, real life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues, the hunt, true crime, 2020. Friday nights, 9 8 Central on ABC. Admit it, these days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America in the afternoon? GMA 3, what you need to know. Lunchtime at 1 Eastern, 12 Central and Pacific on ABC. It's all about you. I know what happened and I'm not guilty. Why the fascination with criminal trials? Figure out what's really out there. She revealed she had murdered his family. I know in my heart they did this. It's the time of suspicion. The ending's really tough. You don't know whether truth is going to be difficult to find unless you try to find it. Do you the reality is our country can collapse from within. You see the white power movement on the march. You will not replace Klansmen and neo-Nazis, skinheads, it's meant to incite war. From the KKK to Oklahoma City to Charlottesville, the new documentary event special. We just need to start talking about race. Homegrown hate, the war among us. This is a real wake-up call. Streaming now on ABC News Live. Burn. Hi, everyone. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. We are monitoring several developments here at ABC News at this hour. Feelings of impending doom. That's what CDC Director Rochelle Walensky says she said, feels with regard to cases, hospitalizations, and now deaths. Once again, all on the rise here in the U.S. The uptick is being blamed on a combination of states easing restrictions quickly, a surge in travel, and the spread of highly contagious variants. But the director says there is still hope that we can change this trajectory and prevent 
prevent a fourth wave. The Suez Canal is now back open for business after six days. The massive container ship that got stuck has now been freed. It could take weeks before all the goods on the ships that were forced to wait reach their destination. And after a weekend that brought heavy flooding to parts of the south, our weather teams are now tracking a new storm threat. But the big story is the first day of the Derek Chauvin trial. And despite the video played around the world, the question that will be central to what the jury decides, what actually killed George Floyd? Alex Perez has more. With the world watching, the prosecution in the most closely followed police misconduct trial in a generation today beginning their case, showing jurors the badge of the Minneapolis Police Department, highlighting the values it represents, compassion and the sanctity of life. Mr. Derek Chauvin betrayed this badge when he used excessive and unreasonable force upon the body of Mr. George Floyd that he put his knees upon his neck and his back, grinding and crushing him until the very breath, no, ladies and gentlemen, until the very life was squeezed out of him. You will learn what happened in that nine minutes and 29 seconds, the most important numbers you will hear in this trial are nine to nine. Prosecutor Jerry Blackwell emphasizing this case is only about the actions of one rogue officer. One of those things that this case is not about all police or all policing. Police officers have difficult jobs. They have to make split second decisions. This case is not about split-second decision-making. Blackwell then preparing jurors for what they would soon see, the video that stunned America raw, unedited, and played for more than eight minutes. You will see that as Mr. Floyd is handcuffed there on the ground, he is verbalizing 27 times, you will hear, in the four minutes and 45 seconds, I can't breathe, please, I can't breathe. You hear him at some point cry out for his mother when he's being squeezed there. You will see that his respiration gets shallower and shallower and finally stops when he speaks his last words. I can't breathe. The prosecutor telling jurors to zero in on one key part. For roughly 53 seconds, he is completely silent and virtually motionless with just sporadic movements. It is the body's automatic reflex when breathing has stopped due to oxygen deprivation. Then the video. Please. Chauvin's attorney up next, moving ahead without acknowledging the horror of what the jury had just seen. Common sense tells you that there are always two sides to a story. There is no political or social cause in this courtroom. But the evidence is far greater than nine minutes and 29 seconds. Nelson arguing Floyd struggled and was difficult to subdue. You will see that three Minneapolis police officers could not overcome the strength of Mr. Floyd. Mr. Chauvin stands five foot nine, 140 pounds. Mr. Floyd is 6'3", weighs 223 pounds. He told the jury the gathering crowd demanding Chauvin get off of Floyd created a, quote, high-stress situation. As the crowd grew in size, seemingly so too did their anger. There are cars stopping, people yelling. There, are a, there is a growing crowd and what officers perceive to be a threat. Derek Chauvin did exactly what he had been trained to do over the course of his 19-year career. The use of force is not attractive, but it is a necessary component of policing. Chauvin's defense hoping to create reasonable doubt around what exactly killed George Floyd. The evidence will show that Mr. Floyd died of a cardiac arrhythmia that occurred as a result of hypertension, his coronary disease, the ingestion of methamphetamine and fentanyl, and the adrenaline throwing, flowing through his body all of which acted to further compromise an already compromised heart.
The prosecutor then calling their first witness, 911 dispatcher Jenna Scurry. She watched the scene play out live over a city camera mounted nearby. She testified that at one point she thought her screen had frozen because the officers were on top of Floyd without moving for such a long time. My instincts were telling me that something's wrong. Something has not right. She says as she became so concerned, she phoned a supervising sergeant, a prosecutor's playing a recording of that call. You can call me a snitch if you want to. I don't know if they had used force or not. They got something out of the back of the squad, and all of them sat on this man. So I don't know if they needed you or not. The jury then hearing from an eyewitness, Donald Williams, who can be heard on that video begging officers to stop. Williams describing the last moments of George Floyd's life. And like the fish in a bag, you seen his eyes slowly, you know, pale out and again slowly roll to the back of his eyes. He was going to distress because of the knee and he vocalized it that I can't breathe. I need to get up and I'm sorry. Alex, thank you. And to help us break this down, we bring in ABC News contributor and host of the Law and Crime Network, Brian Buckmeyer. Thank you so much for joining us. Now, this trial is, of course, just getting underway, but after hearing opening statements from both sides, who do you think seems to have the stronger argument at this point? And what are the key factual questions for the jury? Well, I think both sides came out swinging pretty strong here. What I found interesting, what I was really focusing on, was when they're talking about cause of death, but also manner of death. I think the defense raised some reasonable doubts, especially when talking about George Floyd's neck. The lack of bruising on his neck, I think, was a strong argument. But when the prosecution came out and spoke about manner of death being homicide and not accident, the ultimate conclusion, I thought that was very powerful as well. And much of this case hinges on Floyd's cause of death, as you just mentioned. Walk us through what prosecutors need to prove on that point and, and how the defense could potentially sow reasonable doubt about causation. Yeah, so cause of death is going to be basically how it happened. We're talking about asphyxiation here by the compression of the body, both in the neck and of the upper torso. And so as the prosecution already led on, basically his heart stopped. George Floyd's heart stopped. The question is, why? Now, the defense has a pretty strong argument in that it's a cocktail of drugs in George Floyd's system as well as the increased adrenaline, while the prosecution has the video and the nine minutes and 29 seconds in which Derek Chauvin's knee was on his neck to argue the cause of death. Defense attorney Eric Nelson said, quote, the evidence is far greater than nine minutes and 29 seconds. Is that a convincing argument or do you think that those nine plus minutes tell most of this story? I don't think it's the most convincing argument. I understand what he's trying to say. Uh, we as defense attorneys do it all the time. Uh, the evidence is not as narrow as the prosecution is providing. But when asking the question of murder or manslaughter, you're asking specifically at that point in time in which that person's life uh, ceases to continue, did this person cause a murder or a manslaughter? And I think that nine minutes and 29 seconds kind of clearly shows that it's a hard hurdle uh, for the defense to overcome. George Floyd's death, of course, reignited the Black Lives Matter movement, but the word race was not mentioned a single time in opening statements. Did that surprise you? And how do you think that race might play into this case, if at all? Yeah, I, it's not surprising at all. I think, uh, especially for the prosecution, they want to focus this case on, it's not about what happens outside the court, it's about what happens inside the court. And I think the prosecution believes and is confident in their belief uh, that they can prove this case without having to look at Black Lives Matter protests or other things that happen outside the court. Brian Buckmeyer, thank you so much for your time. I appreciate it. My pleasure. Thank you. And of course, George Floyd's death galvanized social justice protesters worldwide, but it also broke the heart of one young girl, his daughter, Gianna, who we heard from today describing what she wants to be and how she plans to honor her beloved dad. Those police did something that was bad to my dad, and so this is why can, can, we, can you tell me? we are gonna go Fight for justice for my daddy, and we're gonna. When, and when this is over, we gonna have happy memories with him. And I wanna, and I wanna be an artist that can paint 
pictures of my daddy around the whole world. And, and that's it. And I want to make something that pretty and beautiful. And I'm just trying to practice pictures of my daddy so I can make stuff that's pretty for him. And so when he come, he when, when he travels the world, he can see all the pretty memories of him. Wants to be an artist to paint pictures of her daddy. When we come back, who put dozens of endangered turtles from the Galapagos in a suitcase? And our conversation with co-founder of Melissa and Doug Toys about a deeply personal challenge and how she's now trying to help others. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. We have made it through another week together. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. Admit it, these days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America in the afternoon? GMA 3, what you need to know. Lunchtime at 1 Eastern, 12 Central and Pacific on ABC. It's all about you. Robin Roberts, George Stephanopoulos, Michael Strahan. Wake up with America's number one most watched morning show, ABC's Good Morning America. The world may feel out of your control, but your happiness doesn't have to be. Learn the secrets to happiness. Listen to the 10% Happier podcast, free on Apple Podcasts. ABC News, honored. Winner for the second straight year with the Edward R. Murrow Award for overall excellence in television. ABC News, America's number one news source. Friday nights, 9, 8 central. True crime, cinematic, real life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues, the hunt, true crime, 2020. Friday nights, 9, 8 central on ABC. Reality is our country can collapse from within. You see the white power movement on the march. Klansmen and neo-Nazis, skinheads, it's meant to incite war. From the KKK to Oklahoma City to Charlottesville, the new documentary event special. We just need to start talking about race. Homegrown hate, the war among us. This is a real wake-up call. Streaming now on ABC News Live. Burning. Now, when it matters most, the straightforward facts. ABC News is America's number one news. Number one in the morning. Number one in the evening. With America's most watched news cast number one in late night versus the competition the number one news magazine on friday nights number one in politics across this historic election versus the competition the number one daytime talk show and number one in streaming news abc news is america's number one news Welcome back. We are monitoring several international headlines at this hour. The crackdown on protests in Myanmar continues. The death toll is unclear, but ABC News has received reports of violent weekend clashes that resulted in death in several places. Secretary of State Blinken has condemned the violence along with others in the international community, but the military does not appear to be backing down after it seized power from the elected government. The Brazil healthcare system is teetering near collapse after variant-fueled cases continue to surge. More are now dying in Brazil than any other place on earth, but its president and state governors remain divided over just how to tackle the crisis and if lockdowns even work. And take a look at what airport officials discovered in a suitcase. That's 185 endangered baby land turtles taken from the Galapagos Islands as part of a smuggling mission. Ten of them sadly died, but the rest were found in good health. These types of species are said to be very sought after in parts of Asia. If you have children or know anyone with little ones, chances are you've seen the toys made by Melissa and Doug. Classic wooden toys. I know we have our fair share at home without many of the bells and whistles that can be distracting to parents, especially ones working from home. So thank you, Melissa and Doug. Uh, their company has been called one of the happiest on the planet. It was started back in 1988 by Melissa and Doug Bernstein, a married couple who created the first toys themselves right in Doug's parents' garage. Today, the company 
company is a massive global business with more than 5,000 products, all designed by Melissa herself. By the time she was 50 years old, Melissa says that she had a happy marriage, six great kids, and a successful company that made her independently wealthy. But underneath it all, she was suffering from a lifelong battle with depression, anxiety, and despair that she hid from everyone, including her husband. Melissa has now detailed her struggle and recovery in her new book, Lifelines, an inspirational journey from profound darkness to radiant light. Melissa, thank you so much for coming on the show and sharing your story. Thank you, Lindsay, for having me. So from the outside looking in, people would say, well, you seem to have it all, right? Money, career, family. But throughout your life, you say you were racked with this intense, uh, these dark thoughts, asking yourself from a young age, I think even as young as five-year-old, why am I here? And what is the absolute meaning of life? Tell us about your childhood and, and when you realized that you were experiencing the effects of mental illness. You know, I was born knowing something was utterly awry in my being. And I think from my very first breath, I felt like I was from another planet and I didn't belong here. And yes, from the moment I could form words, I asked myself three questions. Why am I here? What is the meaning of life if we are all ultimately going to die? And what am I supposed to do in my brief time here? such profound questions at just five years old. But you say that it was college where you ultimately hit rock bottom. What was happening to you then and, and how did you turn it around? Yeah, you know, being a creative, I needed to live in my heart and do things that brought me joy in my heart. And when I went to college, I really dropped pretty much everything creative that brought me joy. And I anchored to two things only. I anchored to validation through performance and I anchored to validation through being socially accepted. And I ultimately, in my mind, failed at both. I didn't get accepted to the sorority I wanted and I didn't get all A pluses. And when both of those failures occurred, I believed I was utterly worthless because those were the, were the only two ways I valued myself. And yet you met Doug at that same time, right? You were, I think, just 86 pounds. You started to, I think it was anorexia that you had turned to. What brought you out of that? Well, you know, Doug in one sense saved me because he basically forced me to eat, uh, which I was denying myself because when you are in the throes of an eating disorder, you have a demon in your head that really tells you you cannot eat. So he overrode that demon and, and forced me to gain weight, which was great. But I still didn't acknowledge I had the underlying issues and was racked with this existential despair until I was much older really close to middle age, when the cry of my own soul to be seen authentically became so great that I couldn't deny it any longer. And your toys, as you must know, have just brought joy to millions of children around the world, but six children in particular, your six children who range in age from 13 to 27, have grown up with a mother who writes in her memoir that she never felt connected to them. How did they respond to that, and how painful for, was that for you to reveal that to them? You know, it was really painful. I mean, throughout my life, I didn't know how to feel because my feelings of despair were so dark and threatened to submerge me at every turn. I had to deny, repress, and disassociate from everything I felt. So I only had one emotion my whole life, which was at the top of the emotional spectrum. It was great, perfect, good. Anything else, I, I didn't know how to feel. So I desperately wanted children, and I wanted a big family, and I gave them everything I could from a physical need standpoint. But emotionally, you know, I didn't know how to give anything other than, that's great, wonderful, and this idea of wanting to fix them every time they were sad or despairing because I was so terrified it would, it would do them in as it had threatened to do to me. And you've decided to share your recovery journey in your new book called Lifelines, an inspirational journey from profound darkness to radiant light. It's rather atypical in style, a mix of diary writing, poetry verses, and stunning photography. It's beautiful to thumb through. Tell us more about why you wanted to make this book. 
So I wanted to rip off the mask, to be honest. You know, so many people think that when you have it all, right, when you have material success, when you have the, the showy homes, when you have the material wealth and the beautiful company and the beautiful family, that everything must be perfect, right? And I wanted to show that we all can have a mental illness. Depression doesn't discriminate. And I was born with this depression and I will die with it as well. And despite the fact that I have this mental illness and have to work each day to remain steadfast, you know, that doesn't make me any different than anyone else. And I think I wanted to show that I'm human, that I have imperfections and this mental affliction and, and show others that they can have the courage to come out and show exactly Exactly who they are as well. Melissa, thank you so much. Your book has already touched so many people, those lives unknown. Thank you for joining us. Lifelines, an inspirational journey from profound darkness to radiant light is now available wherever books are sold. And if you're struggling with thoughts of suicide or worried about a friend or a loved one, help is available. Call the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline at 1-800-273-8255-TALK or text TALK to 741741 for free confidential support 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Even if you feel like you're alone, you are not alone. And before we go, we were reminded of a story that Deb Roberts brought us last summer during the height of the social justice protest. How do you talk to your children about all of this? Well, many are asking that question again now that the trial has started. And here's Deb Roberts. A final cry on George Floyd's lips, a call for his mother, unleashing a plaintive call to action and reflection for mothers all over the country. It was gut-wrenching. As a mother of a 20-year-old son and the mother of a 7-year-old son and a 17-year-old daughter, three black children, um, to hear someone who knew that it was his final moments mm. um, call out for his mother, it touched upon every fear that I have as a parent of black children. I think as a mom and to hear a guy say mama, I, I just, I, I, I couldn't. I, I couldn't take it. I, I, I couldn't even go beyond that. It just, there's something, you know, I, I think about that, that visceral cry for your mother. You know, you, as a mother, you really hope that your children don't outgrow their need for you. Mm -hmm. And a grown black man in the moment that he knew he needed someone, he wanted his mom. Your kids don't outgrow that need for you. Chelsea Dort, mom of four, including three biracial children with her Haitian-American husband. Not something I ever thought I would need to prepare to deal with. We connected with her and three other moms from across the country, all different upbringings, all pained by conversations they've had or will have with their sons and daughters. We can have hard discussions but this is the safest place to do that is our home. Twyla Dang lives just miles away from where George Floyd took his last breath. A mom of three, her son's almost 17. All of it hits so close to home for us. Karen Fleshman, a mom of two from San Francisco who preferred not showing her children's faces. We are responsible for the education that we give our children. She vows to educate her Asian American son and daughter in a way she never was. Everything I had learned about race and racism growing up was harmful and inaccurate, and I was part of the problem. Crystal McCrary McGuire worries about her daughter and two sons. There's something about black bodies and black skin that too many, not all, but to many people in society, that is viewed as a threat. An idea so potent, so gut-wrenching, one mom took to social media. I dare you, ask yourself, when did my baby become a threat to you? When I cried. When I laugh for joy. When I play with my toy gun. When I wear a mask to protect you and myself. When, when did my baby become a threat to you? When I was born. Well, I, I'd like to talk directly, if I could, to white mothers. I hope you are hearing these black mothers' pain. 
only we white mothers can heal this black mother's pain by raising better white children. Chelsea says images like these break her. When my jeans were too baggy. Chelsea, what about this moment in time has changed anything in you, if it has at all? My children will identify as mostly black. They will, someday my five-year-old won't have like a tiny five-year-old face anymore. And he's not going to have like tiny little hands. Like he's going to be a grown man. A brown man in America. Yeah, and he's going to be someone that people are afraid of. What I can do as a white mother to brown children um, that are growing up in America and how I can support them. Conversations that may be awkward and uncomfortable, but as Karen warns, vital to help value and possibly save a life. I'm worried, but I'm very hopeful. And this is a long overdue reckoning and young people waking up and saying, we are not putting up with this anymore. There's so much work to be done. I'm tired, but I know it's a marathon, not a sprint. I feel terrified and a little overwhelmed, but I am grateful for the opportunity for me to grow and be better. I feel anger and frustration, but I also feel like this is a call to action where the truth will rise to the top. And I do believe that we are on the side of the truth. Our thanks to Deb Roberts for bringing that, us that conversation. That's our show for this hour. Be sure to stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. I'm Lizzie Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Good night.